Feliz Cinco de Mayo, everybody. I'm Dr. Benton, and today we're going to be learning about natural energy resources. So, the standard says talk about the uses and conservation of natural resources and how they impact the Earth, and specifically the differences between renewable, sustainable energy resources like hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, biomass and non-renewable energy resources such as uh, nuclear fossil fuels including oil, coal, natural gas and how we use each of these. So this lecture is actually going to be kind of long. This is a topic I tend to split over a, about a week in class. So I apologize if this is a bit long, we're going to try to fly through it. First you tell me what is a natural resource? Good. And talking about energy producing natural resources, the sun, what do you call it if you have a sun spill? A pleasant day. Wind spill, let's go fly a kite. Oil spill, nobody wants that. So natural means made by nature, not man-made. Resource means that we can use it. So there are lots of things in nature that we can use. Uh, soil, water, air, sunlight, wind, fossil fuels, minerals, metals, plants, animals, trees. Uh, the list is almost limitless if you think about it. Uh, there's tons of stuff found in nature that we use. And one of the easiest ways to determine if it's a natural resource is does it have value? Do we pay money for it? Uh, people pay money for things like plants. People pay money for animals. Now, there are some resources that are not natural. So, like glass, paper. Uh, these things are definitely resources, but they're not found in nature. They're not made by nature. People make glass. People make paper. Uh, bread, medicine. Uh, bread, we have to bake bread. Bread isn't found in nature. Uh, other things like cars, clothes, computers are a little more obviously man-made. But then there are also some natural substances uh, that aren't necessarily resources, meaning we have no use for them. Uh, things like mosquitoes, dog poop. Uh, gang is the rock surrounding an ore that we can't do anything with. We just have to get rid of. Uh, so those aren't considered resources. We don't do anything with them. We can't use them. We tend to divide our natural resources into renewable or non-renewable. Renewable means that we have a practically endless supply. Now, either they can be infinite, like the sun is infinite, or they can just be easily replenished, like crops, plants. We can always plant more plants. It just takes a little time. Uh, so things like plants or animals, we call those exhaustible or sustainable resources. We have to take care of them. We have to conserve them and sustain them and treat them responsibly if we want to have a continuous supply. So if we chop down the entire forest at once and never replant it, then yeah, that's no longer a renewable resource. Uh, overfishing in the ocean. Once we catch all the fish, there are no more fish. Uh, but if we do it responsibly, only a few at a time, then the fish will naturally repopulate and we'll always have a supply of fish. Now, non-renewable resources, by definition, you can't make more of. So they always have a limited supply. Uh, things like metals and minerals, either it's here or it's not. We can't really make new iron. Uh, we can find ways to recycle iron, to reclaim it from the things we've already used it for, but we can't just get more of it. Now, some things like fossil fuels, oil, coal, these things are technically made by nature, so in theory, we could make more of them. But this takes hundreds of millions of years hundreds of millions of years. Uh, so not in human history. Uh, humans are gonna be extinct before more coal and oil are made. So there's, we're not gonna make more coal or oil. Uh, recycling helps, uh, helps the supply last longer. It doesn't really give us more of the product. So specifically, the standard says energy producing natural resources, and there's nine big ones. I want to pause here and have you tell me, looking at each of these, is it renewable or is it non-renewable? Awesome.
All right, so let's go through these. Renewable sources of energy, biomass. And here we're talking about the bodies of plants or any organic matter, really. Uh, hydropower, as long as there's a water cycle, we'll always have water. Wind, as long as there's sunlight, we'll always have wind. And speaking of sunlight, the sun is always gonna shine. So we're always gonna have solar energy. Also geothermal energy, because heat is actually generated inside the core of the earth. And if we could harness it, we can harness it. Uh, it gives us an inexhaustible energy supply. Some things though are non-renewable. Fossil fuels like oil, natural gas, and coal. When they're gone, they're gone. Nuclear is here on the list of non-renewable as well. But I'm gonna put an asterisk next to that one because we have such an enormous supply of fissile materials on Earth, like literally a thousand years. Uh, and at the end of a thousand years, I don't think we're gonna be worried about energy. So, energy resources here in the United States, about a third is coal and about a third is natural gas. So about a third of our electricity is coming from fossil fuels. Oil, also known as petroleum, tiny sliver here. And the reason is oil is more expensive. Oil we try to save and use in cars. We don't burn it for uh, electricity. We use it for vehicles. Now nuclear, huge, has a lot of potential. Uh, of all the energy sources, this definitely produces the most energy per power plant, but it scares a lot of people. And so there's actually been a lack of new power plants built over the last 30 years. Uh, Georgia is building some of the first nuclear power plants in the last 30 years. Uh, so other things besides these, these renewable resources, we tend to refer to as alternative energy sources. And that's because this is relatively newer technology. We say that if the traditional energy resources are fossil fuels, these are alternative energy resources. Uh, they tend to be cleaner. They're renewable, like we said. They're not necessarily as powerful as some of these other guys. And we're gonna talk all about these in a lot more detail. So first, let me tell you how a power plant works. They're steam powered, just like a steam engine, a locomotive. The, what we do is we use the fuel, the fossil fuels, the, the nuclear fuels, we burn them. When we burn them, it obviously creates smoke pollution. We're releasing that carbon back onto Earth as a greenhouse gas. But when we burn them, we boil water. That boiled water makes steam, just like the steam engine, and that steam spins a turbine, like a fan. When we spin the turbine, we spin the generator, and when we spin the generator, it creates electricity. So it's all about this getting something to spin. Uh, and then of course we can reuse that steam water, recycle it so it can boil over again, so we don't just waste a ton of water. Uh, so when we look at a power plant, you see these huge guys. Uh, a lot of people will see them from like The Simpsons, and you think, oh, that's a nuclear power plant. No, every power plant has these. Anytime you need to cool a large amount of water, these are called cooling towers. These tall, skinny guys, these are the chimneys, these are the smokestacks. And if you're burning something like a fossil fuel, you're gonna create a lot of smoke and pollution. So let's talk about fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are made of fossils. Literally, they're the remains of once living organisms. Uh, plants, uh, there were times in Earth's history where there were just a ton of plants, just overgrown with plants, and then they all came and became extinct. They all died, they got buried, and over time they were compacted into coal. There is a lot of coal on Earth, uh, especially here in the United States. We have a ton of coal reserves. It's extremely, uh, it causes a lot of pollution. It's very toxic. Uh, if we tried to use only coal for energy, the Earth would be uninhabitable in about 10 years. We would not be able to survive because of the massive amounts of pollution. Now, other things like petroleum, which is like liquid, like oil. Natural gas, which is a gas. <laughs> uh, when people say gas like gasoline, they're referring to petroleum. Natural gas is more like the stuff you cook with, like a gas stove. 
these are caused from animals, but mostly actually bacteria, like tiny microscopic organisms that floated into the ocean. They made their way to the bottom when they died, they sank to the bottom, and then they got covered. Over time, they turn into oil, and then they also turn into gas. So as they decompose, some of them create a gas, they release a gas, uh, some of them stay liquid, and it has nowhere else to go because it's trapped in the rock. So we can just dig down into the rock and extract it. The problem with fossil fuels is that they release that carbon back into the environment. We're all made of carbon. We're all carbon-based life forms. So when the plants uh, were, were alive, they take the carbon dioxide out of the air. They put it in their bodies to grow. Uh, us as animals, we eat other things that have carbon and then we put it into our bodies to grow. So when we die and we get buried in the ground, we're burying that carbon with us. Humans are literally digging that carbon back up and burning it to release it into the atmosphere. And that's why uh, there's such a massive influx of greenhouse gases. Uh, we're, we're burning these fossil fuels and returning that carbon back into the atmosphere. Now, the, the world is actually not in an immediate danger of running out of fossil fuels. Uh, for a while, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we really worried about it. But as technology advanced, we found a lot more deposits. And the technology to extract those deposits gets cheaper and cheaper. Which is why we continue to use fossil fuels, is they're dirt cheap. Uh, coal, we said we have a ton of, but we can't use it because it's so polluting. Oil, we tend to use mostly for cars, natural gas. Uh, we're switching some cars to natural gas and we're replacing a lot of our coal power plants with the natural gas power plants. Because it is cleaner, it still produces a ton of pollution. Um, so when we look at energy, uh, energy sources over the last, oh, how long is this? I guess 250 years. Starting at about the American Revolution, this yellow line is biomass, like plants. And that, that's just true. We used to burn firewood, right? Things were firewood powered. Uh, well, then we discovered how to dig up coal and use coal, so coal took over. And then we learned how to dig up oil, so oil took over. And now what we're seeing is the switch to natural gas because it's cleaner and the technology is advancing that we can get more power out of it. So we're decreasing our consumption of coal, but we're increasing our consumption of natural gas. The oil level is probably gonna stay about the same in the United States because we still like to drive cars uh, and that's not going away anytime soon. Nuclear power uh, saw a huge uh, influx during the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, a lot of hippies got scared and so we stopped building power plants. Uh, other renewables. So here we're talking about like solar, wind. We are seeing growth in this sector. The amount of growth depends on us. If we buy it, if we spend money on the technology and invest in the technology, we're gonna have a lot more of it. But if we say, nope, give me that cheap power instead, then we're gonna stick with fossil fuels. And so altogether, over 85% of our energy needs come from petroleum, natural gas, and oil. All this other stuff is about 15%. So let's talk about nuclear energy. A lot of people are scared of it because they don't know the difference between a power plant and a bomb. They are not the same thing, I promise. <laughs> uh, some of the strongest forces in nature exist within the nucleus of an atom. When you have these huge atoms, they tend to be unstable and so they spontaneously split. We call that fission. When they do, they release a ton of energy and when done in a nuclear reactor, it actually produces a chain reaction. For every one we split, we create two or three more nuclei that can go on to split two or three more, which can go on to split nine more, which can go on to split 27 more. It's exponential. So by controlling this reaction, we have a massive amount of energy that we can release. Uh, one half inch of uranium nuclear fuel. So think about the, that little bone at the very end of your pinky that size. Uh, that has more energy than 149 gallons of oil, than a ton of coal, uh, than 17,000 
feet of natural gas. Like, it, it's amazing the amount of energy packed into this little nuclear material. Uh, it would take a wind farm 235 square miles to produce the same amount of energy as a nuclear power plant does. So the fuels that we tend to use in the United States, uh, plutonium, uranium, although there's tons of radioactive elements out there, uh, we refine them to purify them, we put them in a reactor, and then we let nature do the rest. It naturally does this, it naturally produces heat to boil that water to power that turbine. Uh, we don't have to dump coal into it every minute of every day, we just throw it underground or in a bunker and then we let it cook. Uh, and like I said, the United States has enough of these uh, fissile materials to last us for the next thousand years. We also have ways to recycle the waste products from nuclear reactions. So these guys that are created, we can also recycle those back into usable materials. And it's zero emissions. And a lot of people don't understand that. So if you can't tell, I'm actually a fan of nuclear power. This is the way, the way it looks. There is no smokestack because we're not burning anything. All that we're doing is putting the nuclear materials in a vat of water and it naturally boils the water. It creates that steam, spins that turbine to spin that generator to create electricity. Lots of cooling towers to cool the water so that it can be reheated into steam again. Now, that being said, the nuclear fuel is very dangerous. Uh, it emits irradiation that will kill you almost instantaneously uh, if exposed to it. Um, it might take a few days actually, but uh, that never really happens. It's happened a few times in the United States when a worker did something uh, kind of boneheaded. Uh, there was this one guy who wanted to see the fuel, so he opened it up and looked at it, and then he got this terrible head cancer almost immediately and died within a few days. Um, the worst nuclear disaster, the one that actually killed people, was Chernobyl, and that was a terribly maintained nuclear power plant. That was the old Soviet Union, and they didn't take care of it. But it did not explode. P people think these things can explode like a bomb. No, the worst they can do is melt down, which is literally melting. You've, you've probably heard of a meltdown. It's melting. That's what it does. It gets so hot that we can't cool it down, and then it melts. And when it does, that radiation escapes into the environment which is harmful. That's why, uh, especially in here in the United States, we spend so much time, so much uh, resources building these containment structures so that there is zero risk of escape. Uh, the fuel that they use for nuclear reactors is not the same as the materials they use in bombs and vice versa. You can't turn a bomb into nuclear fuel. You can't turn nuclear fuel into a bomb. Uh, in terms of reliability, that is 24-7 uh, energy production, nuclear power is number one. Uh, because we don't have to constantly uh, refuel it. If there's an interruption in the coal supply, then we might run out of coal. But here, there, there's no interruption in fuel supply. It's already there, and then it lasts for years. Um, it's not reliant on if the sun is shining or if the wind is blowing. And per power plant, it creates more energy than any other type of power plant. Uh, nuclear power plants are usually at least 10 times more powerful than a coal or a oil plant. Um, Georgia currently has two nuclear power plants. I think one of them is in Waynesboro and the other one is in, it's around Augusta. Uh, they call it the Vogel plant. And they're building two more nuclear power plants. Georgia Power is uh, the first new nuclear power plants in the last three decades. Uh, it's going to power half a million homes and businesses. Uh, and to put that in perspective, I think Georgia has between two and three million homes. Um, and it produces no greenhouse gases. What we see here is steam. This is actually not a nuclear power plant. I can tell because it has a chimney right there. Nuclear power plants don't have chimneys. Uh, this is right here, the containment facility, this little dome bubble where the reactor is. This is just a cooling tower to cool the water because nuclear power can get very hot because it releases a massive amount of energy. Uh, by switching to nuclear power, you're, you're, it's like taking one million cars off the road each year. 
uh, the reduction in uh, greenhouse gases because there's zero emissions. So nuclear power is scary if you don't know how to use it or you don't understand it, but I'm a fan because I understand science. So those are all non-renewable. Once it's gone, we can't really make more of it. Uh, biomass. Biomass is uh, like a kind of like a replacement for fossil fuels. Instead of taking these living things and turning them into coal or oil or natural gas, we just throw them straight in the generator. We, we burn them directly so that they can spin a turbine. Uh, or we can convert these into plastics the same way we usually use petroleum to make plastic products. We can make them using uh, corn waste. Uh, the same way that we use gasoline in cars, we can make liquid fuel like ethanol from plants. Uh, ethanol is made from corn mostly because the United States grows a ton of corn. Uh, other countries, there are other things they can use like sugar cane. Uh, and, and it essentially replaces fossil fuels. The cool thing about these is that you don't have to dig them out of the ground. A lot of it actually comes from recycling. So you remove the, the corn to eat, and what do you do with all this other plant material? Well, let's turn it into a biomass fuel. Uh, you cut down trees, what do you do with all the sawdust? Turn it into biofuel. Uh, industries that produce most things have waste products. A lot of those count as biomass. Uh, if you're on a farm, animals poop. What do you do with all that animal poop? Burn it. Humans poop. What can we do with human poop? Burn it. It has carbon as energy. We can release that. We have the technology. And so it also helps uh, clean up garbage. It gives us something to do with our garbage. Uh, and biomass has been used for thousands of years for things like firewood. Uh, in the United States, biomass is just a tiny, maybe 2% of our total energy needs. Uh, and I think most of that's in the form of ethanol. The, the number one biomass thing we uh, use is wood and uh, the waste products from wood, they decompose into biomass so we can burn them in a power plant. And yeah, that releases carbon dioxide the same way that greenhouse gases do, but it's less carbon dioxide. And if you imagine, it goes right back to the plants it came from, right? So you're taking the carbon out of these plants, burning it, and then the carbon goes right back into the plants. So it's not a clean energy source, it is definitely cleaner. Um, a big problem is that they're trying to bioengineer crops that are that contain a ton of energy that would be very efficient to use as a biofuel. But we're taking away that farmland from growing food. And there's a global food crisis uh, that's only going to increase as the population increases. And so a lot of people are still torn about how effective biomass might be in the long run. It, it's definitely a viable alternative to fossil fuels, though. Geothermal energy, Earth's heat. We, we've said it before, the core of the Earth is extremely hot and that's a renewable resource because it's gonna generate more heat and it's practically inexhaustible. There's so much heat in the Earth, we would never be able to consume it all. What we do is we, instead of burning a fuel to heat the water, we pump that water down into the Earth, it heats up naturally, and so then it comes back up as steam to spin the turbine. Uh, countries with a lot of volcanoes, like Iceland, 100% of their electricity is generated from uh, geothermal power plants. Um, in terms of uh, how much energy can be produced by source, we have the potential uh, to harness a lot of geothermal energy in the United States because a lot of the United States is covered with hot spots, with uh, geothermally active uh, volcanoes, geysers, like Yellowstone National Park here. Problem is, we tend to take those geysers in Yellowstone National Park and we build a national park around them. And so if you say, hey, let's tear down this national park to build a power plant, everybody's gonna hate you, nobody wants to do it. Uh, some places don't have as easy access to underground heat it's still there if you dig deep enough. The problem is you have to dig deep enough, and so it's less effective, less efficient. Uh, this is something interesting, too. This is a slightly different principle. We're not using the heat from the core of the Earth, but we are using heat in the ground. 
in the summer, it acts as a heat sink. It's cooler underground, so we take uh, warm stuff, we pump it underground to cool it. We release that heat into the ground. In the winter, the opposite. It gets really cold up on the surface, but down below it stays a little warm, so we can actually use that to heat water, to heat air. Uh, so we call those uh, heat pumps, and it's good for HVAC and uh, plumbing. And this is something you can do to individual houses. Hydropower is the biggest renewable resource uh, for energy in the United States. Uh, number two is wind, and wind is about to overtake power, but uh, hydropower, we built a ton of back in the 1930s, 1940s. At one point, it was 40% of the United States energy being created by dams. Uh, we've actually been using hydropower to do work for uh, millennia, thousands of years. Uh, it turns a mill, and then you can do anything with that. You can crush grain like a mill, but you can also uh, run a sewing machine like for a factory. So throughout the Industrial Revolution, before the invention of technology, a ton of factories. Most factories were built on rivers so that they could take advantage of this natural labor. Uh, Georgia itself has a lot of hydroelectric dams, mostly in North Georgia and West Georgia, like where we live, and that's because we have rivers. We have high areas and low areas, and gravity naturally moves that water for us. It just All we need is the water cycle to rain and then gravity to bring it downhill, and we can harness that energy. In this case, we still have a turbine that spins the generator to generate electricity, but there's no steam. We're using the water directly flowing to spin the turbine the same way we would a water wheel. So same kind of turbine setup. We're still spinning it, but with no steam. Uh, so it's pretty basic, pretty easy uh, to conceptualize. Problem is building a giant wall in the middle of a river is a, is a massive engineering feat. This is the largest hydroelectric dam in the United States, the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. You might have seen Bill and I talk about this because he, he was based in Washington State uh, and he did a, some episodes with it. Uh, this thing has over twice the energy generating capacity of our biggest nuclear power plant. And remember, nuclear power plants are the huge ones. So hydro has the potential to be even bigger but not every place in the United States has access to these massive rivers that they can dam. Something a lot of people uh, want to look into for the future is actually using the ocean for hydropower. Because we talked about how the ocean moves. It moves in tides, it moves in waves, it moves in currents. These are all things that we can harness for energy. This is naturally occurring flow, naturally occurring motion. And so you can take like a propeller turbine and put it directly under the water and let the currents do it. You can find machines that bend with the waves or rock in the waves or move with the waves. Uh, and then that would generate electricity that would spin a turbine. Or here, it's like you're building a dam that's operated by tides. When the tide comes in, it fills up the reservoir. And then as the tide goes back out, it spins the turbine. Uh, a lot of these are also put in uh, tidal estuaries so that as the water high tide comes in, it spins the blades, and then as the high tide goes out, it spins the blades. There is a lot more uh, energy. Water is a lot more powerful than the wind is. Uh, the problem is the ocean is very, very strong. It's too much energy for us to really harness. And so a lot of this technology is still brand new and it breaks down very quickly because it can't withstand the demands we're asking of it. But in terms of future technological development, this is a, a wonderful source of reliable energy. And it's not, it doesn't take up any land. It's all over the ocean where nobody lives. Wind. Windmills have been around for uh, centuries, since like 100 AD or so. Uh, the way they work is they use the wind to spin something, usually a mill, like to crush grain. Uh, Transportation-wise, we've been sailing using wind power for thousands of years. 
so using wind as an energy source is not something new. What's new is electricity. And we said, hey, we've got these generators we need to spin. Why don't we let the windmill spin it? And so we did, and it works. Uh, individually, they're pretty small, though. They're not nearly as massive as the generators you would find in uh, real power plants. So they don't provide nearly as much electricity. You need more of them. And so we typically build huge wind farms where it's just miles of windmills. Uh, we can do this over land in places where nobody's really using the land. Uh, but the ocean is a great place where we have lots of unused surface. And so you see a lot of wind farms over the ocean, especially in Europe. In Europe, uh, wind power actually provides over 15% of their electricity. In the United States, it's only about 6%. It's a little less than hydro. And the United States really hates windmills for some reason. Uh, I don't know why. They don't work everywhere, obviously. You've got to have wind. There are some places where the wind blows almost 24 hours a day. On the coast, it tends to blow pretty constantly. You've got the land breezes and sea breezes every day. Certain places like mountains, valleys, uh, you might have those constant breezes. Most of Georgia, though, especially southern Georgia, it's very flat and there's not much breeze at all. So Georgia doesn't have any wind turbines. Wind is uh, too unreliable for Georgia. But we do have coasts that have powerful winds on them. Um, Texas has invested a lot in wind technology. Uh, Colorado has invested a lot in wind technology. Uh, even though the wind doesn't blow everywhere all the time, if you install enough of these things in enough places, then it's always going to be blowing somewhere. A lot of people are... Uh, you can't use only wind power. You, it's a great supplement to other energy sources. It's part of a balanced energy grid. Uh, and, and when it works, it works. When it's on, it's on. It does generate a good amount of electricity. Um, but people come up with stupid reasons to hate windmills and, and wind turbines. The, recently, there's some uh, myths on the internet about how it costs more pollution to make a windmill than it saves, or uh, it, it costs more materials to build a windmill than it does to build a, a fossil fuel power plant. That's all, that's all false. <laughs> that does not exist. Uh, I've heard a myth, uh, it costs more to build a windmill than you'll ever save by generating electricity. That's absolutely false. They absolutely pay for themselves, just like every other power plant. There's an initial investment, you've got to buy it and build it, just like when you first buy a car. But then over time you use it and it makes that money back. Uh, a lot of people blame sicknesses on windmills. Oh, the noise is going to make you sick, or windmills cause cancer, and I still don't know why people say that. Cancer has nothing to do with windmills. This is one I can kind of see, uh, that the flickering motion of shadows might cause mental illnesses in people. And, and you might know this too, like if you've ever had a ceiling fan that's casting the shadows and it goes on, off, on, off, it can kind of drive you crazy. The kind of people that would really affect though are the kind of people who are already crazy. So it's, it's more of a hypothetical risk, I think, as well. People also say that windmills kill a lot of birds. And that's kind of true in that birds can fly into the blades and get hit and die. What, what's really true, though, is that this air pollution kills millions more birds than windmills can. Uh, this air pollution from coal power plants, from fossil fuels, kills way more birds than being get than getting hit with a fan blade. So it's just another ridiculous argument against wind power. Uh, wind is a growing industry. It, I think it might be the fastest growing uh, renewable energy industry. Uh, although most of the hydropower was built decades ago. Uh, for solar, a lot of that technology is still coming into existence, and it's not very uh, efficient yet. But wind is out there. Wind is creating jobs. One of uh, Donald Trump's biggest problems with wind is that it's stealing jobs from the honest coal miners. Uh, it already has. There's already ten times more wind jobs in the United States than there are coal miner jobs. Uh, if you saw the thing yesterday, Bill and I was talking about his grandfather used to go to war on a horse. He used to ride a horse into battle, and we don't have to do that anymore because technology advanced. 
Uh, that's what the world does. That's what technology does, and that's what this energy technology has to do. It just has to move beyond thinking that it's too hard to change or too expensive to do. We've got to accept that this is the future, and, and it's happening with or without you. Solar. And this is our uh, fifth energy source, or uh, fifth renewable energy resource, our last one we're talking about today. Sunlight, the most natural, pure, clean, God given thing on earth, I used to say, and then it gave me cancer. And so now the sun is my mortal enemy. Solar panels are unlike any of these other power plants. We're not talking about spinning a generator. Here, we're using photons to electrically excite a membrane, a semiconductor. And that creates a direct flow of electricity. We call it the photovoltaic effect. And the, the physics behind it are like Albert Einstein level physics. He actually discovered it and won the Nobel Prize for it. So when, when I say it's advanced technology, it's advanced technology. That makes it very expensive. That also makes it very difficult uh, to produce, to engineer. Because if you imagine, windmills have existed for thousands of years. Uh, we've been burning wood for thousands of years. This, this is brand new, so it's not very efficient yet. Uh, it exists, it works, but it doesn't generate nearly as much electricity as the other sources. And obviously the sun does not shine 24 hours a day. It shines for about half the day on average. So what we do is we couple this with battery technology. We, we get some very nice batteries, you put them in your house, so that during the day, the solar power charges the batteries, and then at night, you run off battery power. And in that way, it works perfectly. Uh, typically though, if you have like days of clouds and rain, then you might run out of battery power, and so you still gotta be connected to an energy grid. But it's great uh, when it works, just like wind. When it works, it works. So in 1954, these solar panels were about 6% efficient. Nowadays, they're still less than 20% efficient. Um, and here we're talking about something that's like five and a half feet by over three feet. So three by five uh, can only power five 60 watt light bulbs. It's not that much. If you cover your entire house with these solar panels, you'll have enough to power your house and maybe some left over for part of your neighbor's house, but you're not gonna power a city this way. You would have to have every single house with their own solar panels, and then you would need a backup for when the sun isn't shining or when the battery uh, dies. So if you wanna power your own residence, it is a great option. It, it makes you, uh, it takes your reliance off of energy companies. You don't have to use fossil fuels. You become a little more independent but the technology is still growing. Uh, solar powered cars have been uh, in the works since the, the 50s, really, they, they hypothesized them. They still haven't really been done. We, we create prototypes, but what we find out is that the solar power is not strong enough to move a vehicle, especially not a regular vehicle like we're thinking of. Uh, when it does, it moves very slow the, the, even the fastest one. So here, like you strip it down. So it's just wheels. There's, there's maybe room for one person to sit, nothing like the car you're thinking of. And it goes maximum 66 miles per hour, super light. Now, if you try to add actual things like seats and air conditioners and a family and a trunk space, there's no way solar power can do it. It's just not powerful enough, but this is how we make the technology advance. This is how we make it more powerful. We redesign the solar panels, we make them more efficient, and then we can get the car to go faster. We can get the car to carry more weight. And so these engineering competitions where they create solar powered cars are great proof of principle applications. They're proving that the technology works. Now, if you really want energy from the sun, the heat is where the energy is. Uh, directly, you can put these solar collectors on your house. You can use them to heat swimming pools, heat water heaters. You can even use them to uh, pump heat into the air in your house, like a, like a heater, like an HVAC system. Uh, solar ovens exist. You might have seen them uh, when people go camping. 
it literally is like a giant mirror that reflects sunlight onto the food to cook it. And it does get very hot to, and cooks food. Uh, one way that we have scaled up this technology to the size of a power plant that can power a city is by using these solar towers. If you've played uh, Fallout New Vegas, they talk about a solar tower. Um, it's surrounded by mirrors. And if you've ever like held a magnifying glass out in the sunlight, you know it concentrates the beam onto a little dot so you can burn things like ants or leaves with it. Well, here we have thousands of mirrors surrounding the tower, and the t they move. They're, they're programmable. They track the sun, so they're always reflecting that sunlight directly onto the tower from all angles, all directions. You build them in places like a desert where it's, there's not a lot of clouds, there's not a lot of water vapor, so it's always bright and sunny. And we can heat that water up to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit using just the solar energy. Uh, so this is actually... Uh, pretty powerful. We, we can generate a lot of electricity using these solar power towers. They do take up a lot of land space and again you want to build them in places that are sunny. You can't build them in a place like Georgia where it's rainy every other day. Uh, you don't want to have a lot of trees around to block the sun. You don't want to have a lot of uh, hills and mountains that will block the sun. It, it's got to be a very exposed area. Uh, but but the heat energy you can capture is crazy. Uh, birds flying past this thing burst into flames midair. Uh, it ain't it ain't pretty, but it's interesting. So let's recap. Renewable energy, solar energy comes from the sun. Biomass energy comes from all kinds of plants and organic waste. Wind energy, we talked about that in the last unit. It comes from temperature differences across the earth. Wind blows from high pressure to low pressure. Geothermal energy, that comes from heat inside the earth. And then hydropower, that comes from water, the water cycle. Non-renewable energy resources, the big three are fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and then nuclear power as well. So take it out the door. We had all these uh, energy sort resources, these nine energy resources. Which one do you think would be the best one for Georgia to use as its main source of electricity and why? And here I was looking for quotes about like renewable energy resources and I found one from 1931 from Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the electricity industry. Uh, you might know that he invented the light bulb. Well, electricity existed before the light bulb. Electricity has been around since Ben Franklin times, but there was nothing we could do with it, right? It was just funny to look at. When he invented the light bulb, we now had a device powered by electricity that everybody wanted in their house. So he had to build power lines. He had to build power plants to bring that electricity into everybody's houses. So Edison created the world's, uh, the, I guess in the United States, I'm not sure about the world, the first electric companies. By the end of his life in 1931, he was saying that in the future, he'd put his money on the sun, on solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until coal and oil run out before we start to tackle that. And unfortunately, we, we do. We're, we're literally going to have to wait until all of the coal and oil get consumed before people start making the switch. Unless you're smart enough to realize the dangers of things like climate change and global warming and are willing to make the switch before coal and oil run out. It all depends on us and our financial priorities and our political priorities. So thank you for joining me here today. Hopefully you learned a lot about energy.